most. Um, and uh, and so one of the advantages that we have in Africa um, is that you know even though we you know we might have high infection rates, um, our death rates should be um, relatively lower than the rest of, of of the world. You know, again, this is the what this 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 is what the theory seems. And of course, let's see whether the you know it, it turns out. But that's one 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 likely scenario from 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 all the evidence so far that we see in other parts of the world. Uh, and so that's an advantage that we have. Um, the other advantage that we have is that we don't have legacy, right? We don't have so many entrenched ways of doing things. Uh, in many, many ways, we're starting from scratch and as we build our healthcare systems, as we build our education systems, as we, as we build our you know, infrastructure. So we don't have to you know, borrow uh, things that have not worked in the rest of the world. We can reimagine and, and leapfrog and, uh, and, and, and create new ways of doing things um, and, and not just copy best practice. We need new practice, right? And, and that's what we, we can do. So for example, you know, uh, we, one of the biggest problems we, we have to solve in Africa is um, the issue of, of urbanization, housing. We have eight, 800 million people are supposed to move into African cities between 2010 and 2040. That's a massive, a uh, number of people moving to cities. It's going to create all kinds of problems around housing and sanitation and transportation and urban planning, et cetera. So, um, you know, Nigeria alone has a backlog of about 20 million homes and they're building about 150,000 a year. If we say we're going to do the conventional way, it's going to cost us a lot of money and a lot of time. Recently, there has been t technology that has been developed where you can 3D print a house, a two bedroom house, in 24 hours with, at, for less than $4,000, right? So that's an example of a radical invention that, and we should therefore not be building houses the, tra the traditional way. We must be doing this 3D printing of homes and we can get, that's how we'll solve our housing problems. I gave, I've given examples from education and healthcare. So you go down the list. So the lack of legacy means we don't have to, you know, when you go to Europe, They've got cities that are 500 years old, and if they want to change things, they have all this legacy infrastructure that they have to do. We don't have that legacy. We can leapfrog and, and do things differently. Um, of course, now there's some things which are where we're at a disadvantage um, as, as a continent. We, you know, we've got weak healthcare systems. We've got, you know, we lack deep financial uh, markets, capital markets. We don't have a lot of capital. Purchasing power is low. So if you're Starting a business, you know, your consumer often can't pay for the products and services you're selling. You know, we, we, we don't have um, um, a large educa educated workforce. Governance is a big problem. Leadership, problem number one in Africa. <laughs> so we have lots of challenges. But like I said, uh, and, and, and these are the challenges that the rest of the world doesn't have. But like I said, constraints drives innovation. And so it's up to us as Africans to look beyond these challenges and think about how we can be in innovative and, 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 and create uh, you, know, uh, you know, new ways of doing things so that we can overcome these challenges and eventually rise as a continent. Here's a question from Emma Fofana of Orange. What are some of the innovations or practices that have worked in the African context to motivate people beyond having a short-term view, just focusing on their daily bread, to long-term investing in themselves by acquiring knowledge and experience that would prove beneficial, perhaps not immediately, but in their future career? Well, if I'm honestly, I believe that the, the people who we should be looking to make the long-term uh, sacrifices that are needed to develop Africa are not necessarily the people at the bottom of the pyramid. You know, if you are living from hand to mouth and you, you, know, you, you, you literally, you know, you're living on less than a dollar a day and you go onto the streets, onto the market every day to survive, it's very difficult for you to think long term. You need to think long, short term and you need to feed your family today. The people who I believe are letting Africa down are the middle class and the upper class, the people who are educated and who have the luxury to think long term. Most of us are doing the safe things. We're not taking the risk. We're not doing the hard things. So many Africans who are educated, the first thing they want to do is get a job, have a nice house. They're not saving. They're not taking the risk to become entrepreneurs and they're, and, and they're not going to government and we're looking at everyone else to fix the problem. So I think the middle class needs to wake up and it needs to do the things and, be, and that we need to develop the continent. We need a, a change in culture. Culture is a, is a very, very important thing where we, you know, in, ingredient in development. 
where you know we as um, citizens and people who are educated and who have the privilege of you know of knowledge etc and networks should be doing the hard things to solve Africa's problems. We shouldn't be doing the easy things. That's the only way to justify your privilege. So every single person on this call needs to think about how do you actually use your relative privilege to solve the big problems for Africa and to think long-term and to make those sacrifices and to, and to you know, live for, you know, I went, for example, for, you know, when after getting my MBA from Stanford, I had no salary for two years as I was building this African leadership, uh, you know, system. <laughs> and, you know, I, um, I, 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 I made sure that uh, the way I survived was every day I had a meeting for breakfast, one for lunch and one for dinner. And hopefully the person like that, that took me to the meeting would pay for lunch. <laughs> you know, we have to make these sacrifices if we want to be able to, to, to develop uh, the continent. And, 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 you know, a lot has been invested in those few people who have got education, et cetera. It's time to now use the, those people need to go out and actually build the, 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 the infrastructure and the businesses that can actually then lift up the others who don't have the opportunity. You know, one story that I'm that often um, you know I, I like to tell is what happened in South Korea. And you, in in 2000 and um, uh, no, I think it was 19, 1988. There was a something called the, the Asian financial crisis where the there was a, a bunch of um, you know currencies that that um, um, you know, lost their value and South Korea was one of them. And I remember reading about how um, South Koreans went to the central bank to donate their gold to make sure that the currency would rise up again. <laughs> you know, that's how much people were willing to sacrifice to make sure that South Korea would become great. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember um, uh, last year, I met the, the former Secretary General of the UN, Ban Ki-moon, uh, and uh, I, I was sharing the story with him. And he said, yeah, he showed me his, his, his wedding ring. And he said, he doesn't, you know, his wedding finger. I said, I don't have a wedding ring because I'm one of those people who went to go and donate my gold to keep the, current, the country alive. This is the kind of sacrifice that the elite in Africa, those who have education and training and networks should be making if we're going to see Africa move forward. And I think that, um, you know, it's not up to... It's not looking to the poorest of the poor and say you sacrifice to, for, for the betterment of the country. It's 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 really saying how do those who are educated um, and and have the, the opportunities how do how do how do how do we make the sacrifice that we need to to really make Africa great? Last question from Brian Lamar of Earth Capital Africa. He says. I totally agree with Fred's views. We have the talent in Africa, but we need to be flexible and see A, the whole of Africa, and B, the world at large. Would not free movement of people across Africa help? Oh, absolutely. I mean, free movement of people is one of the biggest problems we've had as a continent. I mean, thankfully, the African Continental Free Trade uh, Agreement that has been signed um, is a step in the right direction that's gonna allow at least goods and services to move more freely. You know, it's easier to travel around Africa often as a foreigner than an African. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's great to see several countries in Africa starting to open up their borders for visa-free travel, like Mauritius has done that, Rwanda, Ghana recently did that, I think Senegal, you know, I think Nigeria has also recently done that. It's, it's obviously, you know, harder. I mean, um, it's not being, it's not all working as smoothly as it, as it could, but many countries are beginning to remove barriers to travel, et cetera. Um, for, for business especially. Um, I think that um, one of the advantages though of um, e-commerce and technology is that you can start to overcome those barriers because you can now start hiring people from across the country, the continent without them having to move uh, and, and deal with work permit issues, et cetera. You know, we can start selling to people in other countries without necessarily having the, the issues of that we've had in the past with borders, et cetera. So I think that, um, yeah, we definitely need to see how we re remove barriers because talent must be able to move freely uh, and to be able to, you know, to solve problems that maybe have been solved in one country can go, the talent can move to another country to help that country solve it. Um, and some countries have more established education systems and we can produce more talent that can be used in other parts of, it, of the, con the continent, et cetera. So we need to allow talent to move freely um, and entrepreneurship to move more freely. Um, but I think technology and this moment hopefully will, will, will enable that. Our thanks to Fred Swanaker, 
If you enjoyed the conversation, please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps others to find the show, and for that, we are grateful. Visit theafricareport.com to sign up to our daily wrap, and come say hi on our Twitter and Facebook pages. I'm Nick Norbrook. Thanks for listening.